unlimited good things coming our way. Hallelujah. I'm talking about good things, the good things of God. The Bible says that we can taste and see. That means to really experience the good things of God. I believe that life can be sweet. Amen? Amen. I do. I believe that life can be sweet. And you know what? If you've already had a few bitter experiences, just let God turn those bitter experiences into some sweetness. Amen? God can restore and heal your heart. Just make all those things that one day just didn't seem so great. He can make something good out of everything. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's an exciting day. Just to be living in God. I'm grateful and I'm thankful. You know, every day I get up and I'm thankful just to be living with God. You know, we have something and we cannot afford to lose sight of that. We cannot afford to lose sight of what it's like for people that are out there that don't know God. Amen. That have no assurity. They don't have a hope in a future. Amen? They're, they're riddled by the world's uh, outlook and, and the fear and the things that the world is so concerned about. They're not anchored by the hope that we have of knowing Jesus Christ. That knowing that we have a hope and a future and a good life. That mercy and goodness are going to follow us all the days of our life. And we need to be thankful and grateful. Amen? Amen. You know, I always say if the church would get their eyes upon the good things. Amen? If we would begin to rejoice and just be thankful and delight ourselves in God and in the good things of God. And in the covenant of God. Even if you're not yet seeing all of them. If we would just begin to get really grateful for that and rejoice in that and delight in that. If we would do that. If we would praise. Then we would be ready. Amen? Amen. But instead, you know, sometimes we find ourselves just complaining. And in the complaining part, you know, I say you'll just, you'll end up remaining there. That's what happens. Complain and remain. Or you can praise and be raised. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. So we're going to continue talking today about our divine established identity. Hallelujah. How many of you were here last week? Glory to God. I hope you listened online or through the CD or something and began again to get this truth in you because it's important to us. God has told us that it's time we start living in our divine established identity with the position that that brings. Amen. I don't want anybody in here to have to have an identity crisis. Amen. Only the world has to go through those. I, you know, I hear that all the time. Well, you know, you see a, you know, an older gentleman and, and he's driving a, a red, you know, convertible Corvette. And, you know, I could go on and on. And people say, well, you know, he's having an identity crisis. You know, he's trying to go back to when he's 20. Well, glory to God in the church. We don't have to have any identity crisis. Amen. We get to get in Christ and stay in Christ and know who we are. And that is something. Amen. In Christ, you are somebody. Amen. You are important. You are significant to the kingdom of God. And so I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures from last week and get a run and start here. You don't have to turn with me here. But we remember that in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying. And in verse 4 and 5, he said this. He said, I have glorified you, God. And he's praying to God. He said, I have glorified you on the earth. And I have finished the work with which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And so Jesus was praying to God and he was saying, okay, God, I finished the work. I've glorified you by finishing the work. And now God in turn is going to glorify Jesus by raising Jesus up, restoring him to his positional, his original position with Christ. Amen. So he's going to restore him. And the glory that Jesus is getting is the raising up of himself and the seating at God's right hand. That glory is the exalted position of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so then we see that Jesus continued to pray, prayed for the disciples, and then he prayed for us in verse 20, those that were going to believe upon him according to his word. That means not having physical sight of Jesus, but believing according to the word of God. He prayed for us, me and you, and Jesus said this in verse 22, and he said, the glory which you God gave me, now I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here we see that Jesus said that he was bringing us with him. Amen. That that glory that Jesus was getting, the very same glory, the glory of being raised up to sit at the right hand of God. Jesus is now giving us the same glory, causing us to be raised up with him that we may sit in that exalted position. Hallelujah. I say that's good news. Oh, yeah. Jesus decided he wasn't going to keep it for himself. He was going to bring us in on it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so here we turn over with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to see the fulfillment of Jesus' plan, his prayer, and his declaration. 
Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4, it says, But God who is rich in mercy. Hallelujah. Everybody say, Thank God He's rich in mercy. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Say, Her mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. That's how you get to know that God doesn't have to be mad at you. Amen? Yeah. Every morning when you wake up, it's a new day. Hallelujah. <laughs> Living in the mercy of God. And, and He forgets all of our sins. I love that. He forgets them. Amen? He doesn't just hide them and try to not think about them. He forgets them. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. Amen? For those of you here this morning that might not yet be saved, what a glorious thing. You can have your sins. Every time you've missed the mark, every time you've fallen short, everything you've done wrong, you can have it completely forgiven, wiped away by the blood of Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah? So God who is rich in mercy... Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together yes. with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Nothing of yourself. Nothing of your own works. Nothing you can do. Right. Nothing you're going to do, have done, haven't done. It's all about the blood of Jesus. By grace you have been saved. In verse 6, and raised up together. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's been done. Amen. The church, we the church, we are the church. Not the church walls. We are the church, the body of Christ. We have been raised up with Christ and seated with Him in the heavenly places. As one. I said this last week. It's not like God and Jesus and us. We are one with Christ. We are the body of Christ. The head and the body sitting in the same chair. Amen. Right? Yes. We talked to you, you know, last week, Wynn's body wouldn't be in one chair and his head sitting in another chair. Amen? We are in Christ and we are seated with Him in this exalted position, being where? At the right hand of God the Father. We're talking about the Father of glory. We're talking about the Father of heaven. We're talking about the God that is the one true living God, the greatest God, the God who created all things, the God who spoke the world into existence, the heavens and the earth. We're talking about the God who created the angels. We're talking about who God, just who is, who was and was. I mean, He was before we could even imagine, conceptualize, think of. He was the very existence of everything from the very beginning. Amen. We're talking about that God, that God, the one God, and I'm seated beside him in Christ in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing. I tell you what, if that's not shout news, if that's not jump up and run around the building news, I don't know what is. Amen. God didn't reg uh, relegate us to just sitting down here on the earth and trying to find just a measly, eager way just to plod through this life. No, He said that spiritually we're seated with Him in the heavenly places. That means all of the authority and all of the dominion and all of the power and all of the glory and everything that you saw in Christ while in this earth is resident in you and I right now. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! And that's shouting news, folks. Yeah. Glory to God. Woo! Woo! That's good news. I mean, we could just close the book and go ahead. We would just rejoice about that. Amen? I bet some things would start happening in life. Glory to God. If we could just see ourselves in that exalted position way up there. Hallelujah. I'm talking about we're way up there, folks. We've got the high ground. Amen? So turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 1, just a chapter back. And let's look now. Now, we know that to be the truth. We know Jesus prayed it, and we know if Jesus prayed it, then God heard it, right? Yeah. And the Bible says that if we pray according to the will of God, yes. and we know that God hears us, amen, yeah. then we know that God does for us the petitions that we have. And so we know that it is a truth. I want to say it again. It is the truth. Yeah. Not just true, because true can be a fact that's true at one moment and not true right. the next day. Right. Right. Amen? It could be a fact or, or it could be true that I'm happy today and not happy tomorrow. No, I could not be happy tomorrow. I got God in me. Yeah. Let me think of another example. It could be true that I'm at the church building today, but I'm not at the church building tomorrow, so that would not be true tomorrow, right? But this is a truth, that we are seated with Christ. We have attained that exalted position. That is a truth by which it cannot be changed. Amen? We're talking about the Word of God is truth, and it never changes. Hallelujah. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. 
Now we have the disciples that come along and, you know, their, their goal was to, they received much of the Word of God and wrote it down on paper and they're instructing the disciples. And so today, I'm standing in the position of the disciples. Amen? I feel like the Apostle Paul who's going to instruct us because God has told us some things that we need to know. And Peter made this declaration in one of his epistles. He said, as long as I'm in this tent... I feel like it's my place to remind you. Amen? So this morning, I'm here to remind you about this exalted position. Yep. I'm here to remind you as long as I'm present in this body, I'm going to remind you of this position, of who you are in Christ, of this identity that we have. Because God says we need to know it. We need to get it. It's time to live in the fullness. I mean, we are the body of Christ, and we're supposed to represent the fullness of who He is. Yes. Amen? Listen, God doesn't want you to just have a little piece and a little part. Okay, well, let me just, let me, let me see, you know, I, I can understand the peace of God. And, and so I, I'm going to get the peace of God and I'm going to be stable and peaceful. That's great, but you've got to get the whole fullness of what God has for us. Amen. That's what Jesus laid hold of us for at the cross. The complete package, all of the glory that that exalted position has. And we've got to get it in us. So that we can live it, so that we can attain it, so that we can experience. And so that's what Paul was saying right here in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 18. He's also praying, saying that he never ceases to give thanks for you. And he says in verse 18, he's praying this, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know. Look at that word, know. I want you to underline that in your Bible. Circle it. Highlight it. What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places? In other words, all these things that Paul's wanting us to know is based upon the fact that Jesus was raised up and seated with Him beside God the Father in the heavenly places far above. Everybody say far above. All principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Hallelujah. Not only in this age, but in that which is to come. I love that. I mean, God didn't leave anything under, you know, if he'd have just said in this age, you know, instantly our head would have gone, oh, but they're not living in the day I'm living in. They don't know the struggles that I got. They don't know the things that I'm dealing with. You know, every generation that lives, it seems that they seem to think they got it the worst of anybody. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you know, back in your parents' day, they thought that was it. You know, they just thought it couldn't get any. The truth is, is, you know, the world has been the world. It's been falling from the beginning. Amen. There's, there's not anything new today. God has seen it all. Jesus has seen it all. And He actually took care of all of it. Amen. By raising Jesus up far above yes. all evil, yes. all harm, all stuff that's contrary to God. We're far above it because we've been raised with Him. Amen. So that's what the Scripture is telling us. That Paul, by the instruction of God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, wants to tell us He's praying for us. He's encouraging us. He's exhorting us that we need to know this. Yes, yes. Amen? Not know it in our head, but know it in our heart. That's what makes Christianity different, is it's about a heart condition. It's not about a bunch of head knowledge about anything. Amen? It's about a heart condition. That's why salvation is of the heart. Amen? It's not about whether somebody says with their mouth something about Jesus or not. It's about what they do in their heart. It's about whether their heart is open, whether they receive Christ. Amen? So we've got to get this, this knowing in our heart of what it is that God wants us to know. And he says it right here. He wants us to know the hope of our calling. In other words, what we've been called into. Amen. What we've been called into with God. We've been called into the body of Christ. That means we've been called into the works of Christ. And they that believe on my name, the same works that I shall do, they'll do in greater works. We've been called into this good news, this gospel, this life of Christ to demonstrate the power, the life, the dominion, the glory of God in the earth that we may know what are the riches 
of this glory, our inheritance, us as a saint of God, a household, members of the household of God, us as citizens of heaven, sojourning through this life. We are citizens of heaven. We are a saints of the household of God. And we have an inheritance. We have something that belongs to us. Amen? And it's not just heaven one day. It's heaven in my heart right now. Glory to God. I'm talking to right, right, right now. Hallelujah. We have an inheritance. What belongs to us from being seated in the believer's exalted position with Christ. We have an inheritance. We have riches. How many of you like that word? Ooh, I like that word. Riches. We have riches of this glory. That's part of our inheritance. This glory, this glory, the main position of this glory being who we are, our divine established identity, and the position that we hold there, there are riches of that, of glory, glory, glory. I mean, when we say glory, there's all kinds of definitions of glory. One definition, if you look it up in Vine, says what God is and what God does. I'm talking about we have an inheritance of the glory, the riches of what God is and what God does. That's my inheritance. That's my inheritance. It's not just a far off concept. What God is and what God does is real to me. I'm talking about knowing, remember? Knowing it. The riches of what God is and what God does. Hallelujah. Another definition of glory is the appearing or the manifestation of God's grace and power. Hallelujah. So again, by the Holy Ghost, Paul is saying that we need to know the riches of this appearing and manifestation of God's grace and power in our life as an inheritance right now. Come on, folks, right now. I want you to pull that in with your heart right now. It's no longer the, t the tomorrow. I want to get us into the God of the now. Amen. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, great about forever, but I want to talk about today. I want to talk about right now. Jesus is the same today. The glory of God today. Our exceeded, uh, our exalted seated position, the riches of that glory, the manifestation of God's grace and power for us today. We're to know that. Now see, the one thing I know about God is that God doesn't say He wants us to know something and then doesn't give us the ability to get it. That would not be just. God is just. God is true. God is just. Amen? So if God is telling us, but there again is a key, He's telling us that we need to know. So here again is that part of the God part and the man part. Everything in the gospel, there's a God part and a man part. Amen? And God's always faithful to do His part. He is God. He is faithful. He cannot venture from His Word. There's no shadow of turning with Him. We don't have to worry, you know, is He the same today? What's He going to do tomorrow? He's the same. He's the same. He's the same. And He'll always do His part. But we have an our part. A God, a God part and an our part. Amen? And that's why our part is doing what He said, that we've got to get this knowing in us. This knowing of the riches of what God is and what God does, of the appearing and the manifestation of God's grace and God's power. And another definition is the characteristics and the ways of God Himself. The riches of knowing, the riches of this glory, the riches of the nature and the character of God in me. The riches of the holiness. The riches of the grace, of the graciousness, the kindness, the goodness. Yeah. We're talking about knowing. This all comes from this exalted, seated position that we have next to God in Jesus Christ. We're in Jesus Christ again. It's not Jesus the head is the holy, the holy, powerful, gracious, kind, loving God. It, it's us with Him. Yeah. Partaking of His nature and His character in life. We're talking about that's the way that you have a soft answer for a harsh word. Yes. That's the way that you get to maintain a place of peace and composure in the midst of everything contrary to God breaking out around from you. Because we have the nature and the character. We know. We know the riches of who we are. We know that we have a peace inside us that anchors us. We know that we have a holiness that we can choose to do the right thing. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. So Paul is praying, according to the Holy Ghost, that we would know this inheritance of what we have by this seated position with God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This is important. 
Remember, God told me last month, or actually in January, that we hadn't quite all got this yet. Amen? That tells me something. I see according to the Word of God that God already, before we were sitting here today, decided to say it and write it down. He said, I want all the saints. I want all the saints past, present, and future. I want all the saints right here today of Houston Faith Church. He knew we would be sitting here right here today on March the 6th, 2011. Here together in the presence of God. Hallelujah. He knew he would be here and he already forewrote it. He foreordained it. Amen. That we would know. And then he's telling the Holy Ghost to us. So now it's a rhema word. Now it's not only the written word, but it's a rhema word. I mean, it's a God breathed, God come alive. God is saying, hey church, mm -hmm. hey Houston Faith Church, hey you, I want you to know this. Amen. There's a lot of stuff to know in the Bible, but God is saying right now, I want you to know this. Right. Your divine established identity with the position that that carries. I want you to know what are the riches. What are the riches of what God is and what God does. The manifestation of His grace and His power. I want you to know the characteristics and the, the nature and the ways of God. I want you to know that. Now, to know means... To fully comprehend to the point of experience. Hallelujah. And this is where we miss it. That's it. That's it's a knowing with a comprehension to the point of which we know it so much that we act upon it and it becomes experience. Yes. It's, it's from the inside out. And that's, that's why we get caught up, you know, we have to be careful to not looking for the experience right. to then believe it. See, it's just this little bitty subtle, subtle difference. It's believing it so fully that thrust us out into the receiving and the manifestation and the experience of it. This, this, is, this is what happens in healing a lot. We're looking for the experience, the, the feeling of my body, the something changing to really believe that I'm healed. Instead, if we would absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, say, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed, and it's so real in my heart, there's nothing that can be contrary. Then the experience of that, the manifestation, the appearance of it would be real. Yes. Amen? Amen? And so we see that the word no is very closely tied to the word established. Remember from last week, I said that the word established means uh, set, fixed, settled, secured or made firm and then brought into existence formally ah ah how do we, how does it get brought into existence formally from the inside out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen? amen this is this is the our part to get it so secured inside of us that anything that looks acts appears whatever contrary to that it's just, it's like a flick of a nothing. It's like a, well, I'm not, I'm not concerned with that at all because I know that 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 I know God knows that I know that I know that I know God knows that He knows that He knows that I know the truth of the riches that I have from this exalted position in Christ. Amen? And so we're talking about this knowing in our heart absolutely important that you get it in your heart. Now listen up. You've got to get it in your heart. Right now, I want you to disassociate yourself with everybody that you're associated with. I want you to disassociate yourself from me because you can't live on my revelation. You in your daily life cannot live on my revelation. You can't live by what I've got in my heart. Amen? What you're going to find is that you're going to be living from your own revelation. You've got to live from your own belief in your own heart. You can't live from your husband or your spouse's revelation. You can't live from your brother, your sister, your mama, your daddy, teenagers. Listen up. There's no living according to the revelation of your parents. Once you come into that age of accountability, God looks at you the very same way. You know, you're always wanting to be an adult. Well, here you go. Amen. You get to be an adult in Christ. You got to start learning this yourself, believing it yourself, living it yourself, enforcing it yourself. You've got to get your own revelation. Amen. It's very, very important that you get your own revelation. Many times, you know, we come up, we hear these things and great and yes and amen and shout and it all sounds good. And then it's gone. 
You know, we, we come up here in the prayer line and thank God that we can pray together. Amen. There is power. There's power in prayer and the prayer of believing together. Amen. Amen. And God does put us together so that we can help one another and sharpen one another and encourage one another. But there comes a day for all of us when God expects us to get some things on our own. And there comes a day when you come to the prayer line and want to hook hands with somebody else and let someone else pray out the answer to your problem and and have God, you know, connect with God on your behalf. There comes a day when when it doesn't work like that. There's a responsibility of you knowing it in your heart. There comes a day when, when walking up to the prayer line won't fix everything. Come on, I'm just being real. I mean, you know, to be honest with you, as, as a pastor, you know, I would, I would rather be the other way. I'd rather anybody get to come up anytime and, you know, me pray or you pray or whoever pray and reach heaven for them. But God is telling us that scripture that Paul prayed by the Holy Ghost is prayed for every single saint individually. That we would know these things. Amen. And many times, you know, it can get right down to life and death. That's right. Depending on what you know. I mean, these things of the Bible, you know, sometimes they're life and death. and, And I'm reminded that God keeps telling us that it's important to get this. You know, I hate to say it, but I will. I know people that have departed the earth early because they didn't get some things that they needed to get. I remember particularly I was sitting in someone's house one time that was sick. And, you know, they'd been sick a while and we were over there and wanted to pray for them and help them. And while we were just sitting there, the Lord spoke something to me about a particular Bible principle. And I looked up at them and I, I asked them this question. And they said, well, no, no, you know, that's not for me. I mean, I don't mind, I don't mind that other people, but that's not for me. And when they said that to me, God said this to me. This is exactly what he said. He said, that's the very thing that they need in order to receive their healing. Now, it wasn't God that was holding back their healing. It was something in their own soul of not being able to grasp on to the truth of, of, of God's Word. You know, we have so, it's soul issues. Yeah, that's true. That's and the only thing that's greater than your soul issue is the Word of God. Yes. That's the only thing that's greater than your soul issues, than your mind and your thoughts and your reasonings and your, you know, life experiences. The only thing that's greater is the Word of God. That's right. That's why we never get to measure the Word of God by our experiences. Instead, we have to look at the Word of God and measure our experiences in relation to that. But I will never forget it because I was so grieved in my heart. Because God said the very thing that they need in order to get well, they have rejected. And I want you to know that they died. And there wasn't a thing that I could do. There are things that we have to get in us. And when God says to get them in us, it's important to get them in us. Now, we've got to start taking, you know, it all starts in our mind. The, the battle is in the mind. I mean, we know that. And we can't stop a thought from crossing by our mind. Amen? But we can and we must stop any thought that is contrary to the reality of our exalted position with Christ. Any thought that comes that is contrary to the riches of this glory of us being seated with Christ in the heavenly places with all power and all might and all dominion far above every principality and everything that's contrary to the knowledge of God. We've got to take those captive and and reject them. We've got to throw them away. We've got to thrust them out. We've got to get our mind renewed to this truth of who we are. We've got to get our mind. We need a good old-fashioned brainwashing by the word every day. Listen, you know your old stinky body. You know, you do wash it, right? And you don't go for, you know, you don't, you don't wash just on Sunday morning and just on Wednesday night. Do you? Some of you sitting there thinking, I wish I could. No. <laughs> you know the importance of keeping your body clean. I mean, it's the same thing with your mind. It's not good enough for you to come on Sunday morning and rejoice at the message and then, and then wait, go all week and then, you know, drag yourself in here on Wednesday night for a little bit. you got to get your brain washed, renewed, cleansed, free, thinking the right things every day. You've got to get a brainwashed and you've got to get your mind renewed so that you can think right. 
And why is that important? My teenagers know because your thoughts become your, Chris, your beliefs. And your beliefs become your words. And your words become your actions. And your actions become your... The teenagers are learning something, glory to God. All right. God told me last night as I was, you know, sitting with God, meditating and thinking about that. He told me to tell you that you're living in the collective sum of your thoughts. Woo! I'm like, yes, sir. You are living in the collective sum of your thoughts because your thoughts become your beliefs and your beliefs become your words and your words become your actions and your actions represent your life. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, amen? So we're living out of our thought realm and that's why we've got to get our mind renewed as to who we are in God, as to what Christ has attained for us, as to what happens because we are seated in Jesus Christ beside God the Father. It's important. we got to get it. Amen? Now turn with me over to Hebrews. Chapter 5. Right now, it's time for us, the church, to grow up in the knowledge of this exalted position. It is time. Amen? Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 11, it says, Of whom we have much to say. This is Paul now writing Hebrews. He's saying, Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. No. No, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So being dull leads to a lack of spiritual growth. Amen? Being dull leads to a lack of spiritual growth. And why are people dull? Why are people not hearing? Why are people not growing? Because they have not pursued the understanding of spiritual things. They have not pursued. Not that God has not given. Not that God has not said. Not that God has not given us every... The Bible says that we have everything that pertains to godliness and life. That we partake of the very nature and the character of God. Don't tell me that you can't understand it. You have the Holy Ghost in you who knows all things. The best and greatest teacher ever lives right on the inside of you. Everything that you have is in Christ, which is in you. Your job is just to pursue it so that you can gain knowledge and understanding of it. Amen? So we become dull and we, we lack growth of, uh, uh, in our spiritual life of growing up into the full sonship of God, the full manifestation of the things that we need to know because we don't pursue. That's why I love that scripture where Paul said it in Philippians, and I always take it out of the Amplified. But he said, it is my determined purpose. Paul said this at the end of his life. We're talking about a man who had great revelation of God, visitations, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He said, it is my determined purpose that I become more intimately acquainted with the wonders of his person. Paul, after all these years, all these revelations, visitations from heaven, he's saying it's my determined purpose. It's my hot pursuit to become more intimately acquainted with the person of God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's where we need to find ourselves so that we don't become dull in hearing. Amen? We don't want to be in this category of the dull in hearing people. Amen? You know, we see Jesus said it in his days. He was constantly saying how I want to explain something. But I can't really explain it because you can't hear it. Now, you know, back in Jesus' day, I I give the people, okay, they weren't saved. They didn't have the Holy Ghost in them. So you have to give them a little bit of slack. They didn't have what we have. They didn't have the potential that we had at that moment. But Jesus still said it. He said, I've got knowledge of things and I want to tell you things and share things with you that I can't do it because you're not ready. And now we see Paul saying it to the church. Amen? Amen. 
saying, I got some things and I want to share some things, but, but they're just hard to explain because you're not ready. Why? Because you're babes. Because you're, you're not ready to, to receive the, the mature things of the kingdom. We've heard people say it. We've heard men and women of God today still saying it. Charles Finney made this statement. I like it. He said this. He said, there are things I have found to feast my soul upon with which I have no man to share it. There was things in God that he found to feast his soul and his life, things that he could glean of heaven, that he couldn't even find anyone to share it or talk with it about. I know that Allison would know, Brother Hagin used to say that all the time, right? He's constantly saying he knew things in God that he just couldn't yet share because you're not ready to hear it. You know, I've experienced that with people. Sometimes people come in with a problem or an issue, and there's things that I know of God that they need to know to help them, but they're nowhere in them. They're no way anywhere near in a place where I can share it. Yeah. Right. I know many times the wall that's up. Mm -hmm. And it's, most of the time it's not even a purposeful wall. Right. But you know, we, we got our walls up. We, we know what we know and we're happy with what we know. Yeah. And we want to put our, put our stuff in, in what we know and then we want to look at God and say, well, why God? No, 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 not why God, why not us? Yes. Amen? That's true. So we got to get in hot pursuit of these things so that we can grow. See, because it says that when, when they can't hear these things, they're only taking of the milk and they're becoming unskillful in the word of righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? It's our being right with God. It's our position with God. It's our exalted position. It's the position that we have in, in God. So what he's saying here is that people haven't pursued it and they can't grasp and be skillful in their divine established identity with the position that they carry. Uh -huh. That's what he's saying, that they're unskilled. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We don't want to be in that category. We want to be skilled in our righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. We want to know who we are. We want to know what the riches of this glory that we have in God, what that is. And if you look at Romans 1.17, it says this. It says, for in it the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For in this good news of Jesus Christ, the righteousness, our divine established identity with position, is revealed from what? From faith to faith. Yep. From knowledge to knowledge. From understanding to understanding. It's, it's a growth. It's a process. Yep. Not that you ever get more right with God. I mean, the minute you're saved, you're instantly made right. Perfect. But your knowledge of that comes from faith to faith to faith to faith. How do we get faith? Yes. Faith comes by the hearing, hearing of the Word of God. Amen? So this is where it's back on our part of us growing from faith to faith to faith. Greater revelation, greater knowledge, greater understanding so that we can apply this truth of who we are in Christ and the position that it carries. Amen? Amen. And it's important. It's important that we be skillful. What does to be skillful mean? To be skillful means to use the knowledge that you have. That's right. yeah. Yeah. If you really have knowledge, if you have a knowing of it so deeply planted in here, you will use what you know. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that means when something comes up to you, that is an opposition of the truth of who you are in Christ and where you sit with Him in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing far above all principality, uh, pality and power and might and dominion and everything that is named that you will be able to use the truth of that to enforce in this earth the reality of that truth. That's being skillful. Amen? And that's what we're after. That's what God is telling us that we are after. We need to get it. We need to know it. We need to be skillful in using, amen, amen. the knowledge of these riches of the glory of, of who we are in Christ, of where we sit with Him. That's how Jesus did. That's definitely what Jesus did. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, He had things that came up against Him all the time that were not of God. It was not God's will. It was not God's way. And what did He do? He was skillful. He was skillful to use what? Who he was in God. Jesus knew he was the Son of God. He knew where he stood with God. He knew that he was one with God. He has this real short little scripture, I think it's in John 10, 30, and he just says, we are one. And that's just about it. That's just about the whole basis of Jesus, why he got results every time he did something. is because he was in total union with God. He knew that when he said something, God backed it in heaven. 
He knew that when he was going to do something, it was backed in heaven. Amen? He only did what God did. He only said what God did. It was a working relationship. Just like we have now with the Holy Ghost. Amen. He was operating with the same Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. But it's through that union that Jesus enforced the truth of these things in the earth. And so it is with us. There's no lack. There's no lack in the exalted position. There's no failure in the exalted position. There's no fear and no worry in the exalted position. Amen? Isn't that the truth? So if we are, are fear, fearful or worried, that means we're being unskillful. If we're succumbing to weakness and, and inferiority, that means we're not being skillful. If you're not hanging on till you persevere to the end and win, you're being unskillful. And you better get back in your book. You get back in the Word of God with the Holy Ghost. Amen? And get this thing, this Word, this reality, this truth alive in us so that we can live according to this. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, it is important what we believe. It, it, again, it's about a belief. It's important that we believe this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We know that scripture, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is what you think. God just said it earlier, didn't he? That your life is the collective sum of your thoughts. What you think becomes your beliefs. Isn't that true? Yeah. The question to you is, do you see yourself as the position that Christ says you have in Him? Is that how you see yourself? When things come up to you, when, when, when an opposition comes to you, is your first thought who you are in Christ? No, I'm more than a conqueror. No, I, I, God always causes me to triumph. No, I always have the victory. It is the Word of God is, is the right place that you sit, this union that you have with Jesus Christ, is that what comes to the forefront? Because listen, when the test comes, you know, it's easy to shout on Sunday morning. That's true. That's true. But what happened, you know, no, no test. I mean, we're all sitting here right now. We're feeling pretty good. If we've got something going on, it's kind of, you know, shut outside the doors. But then we walk out into reality, amen? That's true. And so the goal is, you know, or the, the question is, what's going to happen when the test comes? What, what happens when the trial comes? What happens when the opposition comes? If your first reaction is not from a place of, of who we are in Christ, then that means you haven't quite yet mastered it and gotten skillful in it. Amen? I know years ago, uh, God had me, you know, read, read a book. I had not read it yet at that point. This is a long time ago, but it was one of Brother Hagin's book called The Triumphant Church. Great book. And I was reading that book and grasping that book, and I mean, I got it in me. I was the triumphant church. I mean, I was the triumphant church. There was no convincing me I was not. Amen? And then I got a call. I got a call. I was at work one day. This is when I was still working a secular job. And I got a call. And that uh, was a friend of mine. And she said, you know, I was vacuuming today. And I don't know why. She said, the Lord told me to call you and tell you something. And I said, well, Lord, I know she knows that. And God said, well, call her and tell her anyway. And so she said, I just want you to know that you're the triumphant church. And I said, yes, amen, I am the triumphant church. And you're right. Now, see, God, she told God, you know, I know she knows that. And God said, yeah. Yeah, God, I know that. But thank you for telling me. Glory to God, I am the triumphant church. Woo well, I hung up. And then I got another phone call. And I got another phone call from the doctor. The doctor telling me that I had skin cancer. And do you know, and see, I, I smile when I say it. Because I remember so clearly that day when I got the call. And they said to me, well, you know, we, uh, we took that and looked at that, and it's skin cancer, you know, it's melanoma, and we've made, a call, we've made an appointment for you. And the whole time they were talking, you know, it just became like something, because I was thinking, I am the triumphant church. <laughs> I am the triumphant church. There is no way I am the triumphant church. This cannot, uh-uh, this will not defeat me. There is no way, there is no, no place for this to be in me, amen? And I want to say, you know, that I won the battle, hallelujah. Through the Word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, I won the battle. I am cancer-free. Hallelujah. But that was in me. Amen. And I was so grateful that, number one, when God told me to read the book, I read the book. Just like God's telling you something, you better get this in you. Amen. It's important when God says it to get it in us. Amen. 
And so God's given us, he's given us everything that we need. And that's why Jesus said, you know, he said, I want you to, to, to just occupy until I come. I mean, he raised us with him, seated us, gave us every spiritual blessing, established an identity for us, gave us an exalted position with all the riches of all that glory. And he said, now you just go ahead and occupy till I come. In other words, you just take your place, take your stance, and do be another, another translation says, do business till I come. I like that one. Do business till I come. Amen. Just knowing who you are and where you're seated, I want you to just do business. Amen? Amen. And so that's where, you know, you can't let the, the natural things of life take up all of your time, church. That's true. That's true. That's true. We can't let the natural life prioritize, be the, the main focus of our life. You're here with a different purpose. And you need to remember it every day. I'm here with a purpose. And it's a Christ purpose. It's a kingdom purpose. It's a business purpose. Amen? Now, not being busy, busy, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's joke, that's always the way I put it. Busy, being busy, being under Satan's yoke. Or you can be about the Father's business. Amen. There's a whole big difference being under the Spirit's influence. That's the way I look at it. Yes. And if you'll get your priorities straight, then your natural life will come up under the reality of your spiritual life and things will be balanced and in order. And that's why we got so much of the church out there struggling all the time with all the stuff of their life. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, that we're to seek the kingdom of God and His what? His righteousness, which is what? Our, our standing. It's our identity. We're supposed to pursue the kingdom of God and who we are in Christ and the position that we hold in Christ. We're supposed to seek that first and everything else will be added. The things being added will be automatically because they belong to us in the inheritance. So, i.e., church, those of you that are looking for a way to get your natural life balanced, if you'll seek first, by truth and by application, Matthew 6, 33, of seeking who you are in Christ, the position that you have, then God will be able to help you balance out and you'll be able to be about the Father's business everywhere you go. Yeah. Even at work, even at your job, even in your yeah. home life. I'm telling y'all, it works. Yes. I'm telling you, it works. I've done it. You know, I wasn't always full-time in ministry. I know y'all are thinking that we don't do anything anyway. <laughs> right, Tammy? Right? Don't they think we don't do anything? And Tammy's like, oh, goodness. But I had a secular job, a very high-powered, a very demanding job with lots of hours, amen? But I put it to practice, the seeking first the kingdom of God. Man, and God just ordered things out. I mean, my life just came right up under my spiritual life. We got to put spiritual things first. We got to be heavenly-minded first, amen? And in so doing, I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1 and watch what happens here. Talking about prioritizing. And again, it's this, it's this pursuit of righteousness. It's just so important to God. You know, one time I, I got on a little thing with God, and I was like, God, I just want to know what the real... Tell me what the real source... I'm not talking about... I know God's the source. But tell me for me, as a human in the earth, tell me what's the real key, the real source of, of operating in the power of God. Isn't that a great question? It was great to me at the time because I really wanted to know. I really wanted to operate in the kingdom. I want to live powerfully. I want to live supernaturally. I want to operate in this, this power of God. And so I asked God, God, what really is the key to operating to, to, to the power of this, this kingdom of God? And, and he told me that the answer was in the Bible. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Hebrews 1. 8 through 9. I'm not going to go through it today, but you need to read it. It tells you that righteousness is the power of the kingdom. If you will get righteousness, if you will understand your righteousness, if you will know your divine established identity and the riches of the glory of this exalted position that we have in Christ, amen, you will know the power of the kingdom because you will see yourself as one with Jesus. You won't be saying something, and, oh, okay, God, hey, God, would you do that? No, I mean, in you, it's just going to come from you. It's just going to thrust out of you. Amen? It's righteousness. It's a key to the kingdom. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, Paul again praying, 
And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Now remember what Matthew 6.33 just said? We're supposed to be seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We're supposed to be seeking heavenly things. We're supposed to be about the Father's business. We're supposed to be in pursuit of spiritual life. And that, that doesn't mean that you neglect your natural life. It means that you get power from God to take care and rule in your natural life. Did you hear that? You get to rule in your natural life. But you've got to do it spiritually. And so when we approve the things that are excellent, put things in the right priority, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. When we seek first our righteousness, then we get to be filled with the fruits of the righteous, the fruit of being right with God, the fruit of our divine established identity, the fruit of this exalted position and all the riches of it. In other words, we're going to be filled with it. In other words, the fruit shows up. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. The fruit shows up. The fruit of it, the experience of it, the reality of it shows up. Woo! Glory to God. I just preach myself happy and I just keep dancing about it. That is just like, isn't that just like God? You know, sometimes we pursue something and we pursue like a piece of it. But I, but I just say, let's pursue it. I just like that. Let's pursue it all. You know, get, get out the Bible and go through all the righteousness scriptures and see what you find. The riches of all the things that we gain in knowing our righteousness. I mean, we could have left the world. But now we get to know not. We do all this, and there's fruit that shows up. Yeah. Glory to God. Fruit. Fruit from our labor. Yes. I think Jesus had some fruit, don't you think so? I mean, that's what happened with him. He exhibited the nature and the character and the power of God every, everywhere he went. Everywhere he went, everything he said, everything he did. And so it should be with us. We should be exhibiting the nature and the power and the life and the glory of the kingdom of God in the earth right now. And we do it from our place of righteousness. That's what it's all about. Living in the kingdom, living supernaturally. God's already given us the kingdom. Jesus said it. He said it was the Father's pleasure. It was his pleasure. He looked at me and he said, I want to just give you the kingdom. He didn't give me a piece of the kingdom. He didn't just give me a little piece. He gave me the whole kingdom. Yeah. Paul said, all things are mine. All things are yours. All things are mine. All things are yours. I'm going to order y'all some, I'm going to order y'all some running shoes. You need to get up and run sometimes and shout at these kind of things. I'll tell you what I remember. I remember the first time I ever got a revelation. Like my own little, you know, revelation. I was reading in my bed one night. This was early on in my days. And I was, I was reading in my bed one night. And I had my Bible, you know. I was in my bed and laying there. I won't lay down. And I was laying there. And all of a sudden something went up in me. I remember it was John 1. It was about Jesus being the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all of a sudden, it's like this light bulb went off. That when, I, when I said that the Word of God, that Jesus was on the scene. And I'm telling you what, I jumped up out of my bed, and I'm Woo running around my room like this with the Bible. Glory to God, glory to God. When I read the Bible, it's Jesus. Jesus is on the scene. Jesus is doing it. It's just like Jesus is right. And I just went, well, have you ever done that? If you haven't, you need to. Amen. Yeah. Some of you might not, you know, if you're lacking, a, if you're experiencing a little dullness, get out and do something extravagant. Yes. Now you're thinking, I know Pastor Joni, you know, you're a little bit out there. I'm not quite like, that's okay, you can do it. There are times that I get quiet, not a lot. But I do get quiet, amen? 
So it's time for us to take our rightful place, this exalted position. Amen. Turn with me over to Habakkuk 3. We're going to close. But I want to close with a scripture and then tell you a story. Hallelujah. Is anybody happy today? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. All right, next week when y'all come, I'm going to have tap shoes for some <laughs> and track shoes for others. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Do you know where Habakkuk is? You know, when you get to heaven, Habakkuk's going to be meeting you. Did you read my book? Did you read my book? Did you read my book? Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 19. It says, The Lord my God, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on my high hills. I'm walking in the high places. God is my strength. Come on, get your hands in the air. God is my strength and I'm walking on the high places. He's causing me to walk on the high hills. Far above all problems and trials and tests and tribulations. I'm walking in the high places. Glory to God. Now I heard this story told one time and I just thought this was one of the best stories. So I'm going to tell it to you. Amen. This was told by a pastor about a friend of hers. Uh, she had a pastor friend who lives out in the country. And so she was driving down the old uh, country highway one day. And this particular lady loves animals. And so she saw a baby a goat. And that baby goat was being chased by a coyote. Okay? She saw this as she was running down, riding down the street. And so she felt bad for the goat, you know. And she thought to herself, well, I'm going to stop. I'm going to pull over and I'll help the goat. Amen? So she stopped and pulled over and... She opened her car door, and about the time she opened her car door, you know, her thought was, I'm going to get out and see if I can get the goat. You know, the, she said the minute that she opened her car door, the goat flew and just jumped straight in. She didn't even have a chance to get out of her car. The goat jumped straight in her lap. And so there she's sitting here. No, glory to God. Amen. Listen, the goat saw an entrance. Yes. An entrance to safety, and he took it. Okay? He didn't have to be coaxed. Come on, church. You know, we don't need God saying, come on. Come on. You know, she didn't have to open the door. Yeah. He instantly, he saw that entrance in, and he said, I'm in there, man. I'm in there. Woo! I get, I get to do this with my husband. Woo! Like this. <laughs> Glory to God now. It was a goat, though. It was a goat. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So anyway, she, she said, okay, well, you know, so she closed the car door. She drives to her house with a goat sitting in her lap. I mean, she didn't know what else to do with him. You know, and she's kind of ha, 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 you know, the old coyote, old hungry thing, you know. Of course, I don't know why she didn't bother that the coyote was hungry, but I can relate. So anyway, she gets out to her house, puts the goat out, walks out, goes and walks in her house, and she said the coyote just following her. I mean, the goat, I'm sorry, the goat just right with her. You know, she puts him out. She starts walking. He's walking right with her. She said she opens the house, and he just walks right in like he belongs in the house. It's a picture of the church. We belong. We've been given the kingdom. We belong in that exalted position. We have the rights to it. We don't have to cower down and beg God. I mean, we get to come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find help in a time of need. So here she was, you know, she's looking and that goat comes right on, you know, he blind. All of a sudden, listen to this, he jumps up on the countertop. Glory to God, he takes the high spot. Now listen, listen, why did the goat do that? Because that's what goats are used to. They want the high ground. I mean, that goat wanted the high ground. He said, man, I'll tell you what, I'm getting up in the high spot. And that's how we need to see ourselves in the high spot. You know, some of us are such used to low living and seeing ourselves in the low spot that we don't even know where the high spot is anymore. Listen, that goat, when it came in, it had been being chased by the enemy. It didn't go over the corner and find it a little, a little square. No, it didn't. You know, it didn't go get by the stove. It said, you know what? You know what I'm going to do to seek comfort after my enemy has been chased? I'm taking the high spot. I'm getting up on the high. Come on, church. Come on, church. Isn't it time we take some go ground? Come on, can't we take go ground? Can't we get up and think right? Think high and live high and talk high? Amen. And listen, that goat didn't have to be trained about that high spot. It didn't have to be sat down and talked or cried. That goat knew it was in him. He knew that his safety, 
that his security, his comfort, I'm sure his heart was like this, you know, the coyote chasing him and now some weird lady holding him and riding in a car. I'm sure that was all a bit traumatic. But what he did to comfort himself was he got up to the high place. Amen. We got to get up on the high place. We got to take our position in Christ. Sit down where we belong and, and enjoy the rights and the benefits and the privileges. Because that is in us. That's what God's put in us. That is our God nature. It is our God position. Amen. It is our God place in the high place, the exalted position with Jesus Christ, experiencing all the glory of God. Amen? Yeah. Come on, church. Yeah. Are we going to take some go ground? Amen? Come on. Yeah. Come on. we got to get in the high place and live there. Amen? Glory to God.